Hello everyone. Uh, very good. Good afternoon to all of you. My name is Rajiv Jairaman. I'm the founder and CEO of Nolscape and the author of uh, a book called Clearing the Digital Blur, which is about to hit the stands by end of the month. Uh, happy to co-host this webinar along with Manish Bell, uh, who is the AVP for the Center for the Future of Work. And uh, Manish will be joining us pretty soon. I'll get started with the proceedings. So here's a quick introduction from my end. So I'm the founder and CEO of Nolscape. Nolscape is, um, uh, is an integrated learning and assessments platform that helps organizations accelerate employee development. I'm an author and also the chief people officer of the company, and I'm very interested in shaping the future of learning and uh, talent transformation. So here's a, a little bit about me. Um, so I've been fortunate to build a team, a global team that pioneers world-class learning and assessments platform, and we work with 300 plus leading companies across 25 countries. Author of this book called Clearing the Digital Blur, deeply interested in uh, technology, design, and learning. And I've delivered three um, TEDx talks at Bitspilani, XLRI, Jamshedpur, and one at CA Technologies in uh, Hyderabad. And I've delivered many guest lectures at INSEAD, IM Bangalore, IIT Madras, and so on and so forth. And I'm uh, very deeply passionate uh, about uh, innovation, new product development, leadership. Uh, digital is, um, is a topic that's uh, pretty close to my heart. So that's uh, very quickly about me. Uh, a little bit of logistics before or housekeeping before we get started. Um, the audio button for you is on mute. Uh, you can always post a question on the chat window. And the format is that I will kickstart this presentation. I will, um, for the first 20 minutes, talk about the why, what, and uh, how of uh, the future of learning. And post that, Manish uh, will present his point of view. And uh, towards the end, the last 15 minutes, we will focus on the Q&A. So we will get started right away. Future of learning, that's the reason why we're all here. A lot of things are changing around us. Today, we will try and understand the why, the what, and the how. So let's get started with the why. So we are looking at the eye of a storm right now with a lot of massive disruptions happening all around us. Pierre Nantum, the CEO of uh, Accenture says that uh, since the year 2000, more than 50% of companies on the Fortune 500 list have uh, essentially disappeared from that list. So we need to understand the, the context of work the context of digital disruption, and hence we will arrive at the right recipe for uh, learning as well. What should the future of learning look like? So let's start with the why. In 2008, the year in which I uh, started Nolscape in Singapore um, out of NCR after my graduation from there, this is how the world looked like. We had Hillary Clinton as one of the presidential candidates, and this is how we interacted with that candidate. Fast forward to 2016, this is what changed. We, we all got enabled by smartphones, broadband, connectivity, and you know this is the, the future of you. We became very important in the whole scheme of things. The problem is no one can uh, predict the future, right? So technology is growing at an exponential pace. But the problem is organizations, governments, and individuals are not able to keep pace. So we are not able to predict the future because the new normal has kicked in. Not even Bill can predict the future. So here I'm not talking about Bill Clinton. I'm talking about Bill Gates. So when uh, Bill Gates was asked by The Economist in uh, the year 1998, you know, how would the world look in 2016? This is what he said. Eventually, everyone's business card will have an electronic mailing mail address. He's talking about an email address. So this is the best that Bill Gates could do, somebody at the top of his game in 1988. So prediction is a very difficult business, and uh, futurists have a tough job because it's really difficult uh, to catch the exponential trend that is unlocked by technology. So these are jobs that did not exist 10 years ago, right? We did not have an iOS developer. We did not have an Android developer, no data scientists, no big data architects. 
there was no zumba instructor either right so 10 years ago it would have been near impossible to predict that these would be the uh, the in jobs of today right so we almost often get it wrong and here is something that uh, caught my attention meet mr keith browning he is an emoji translator right so he's the world's first emoji translator and this is a job i bet you couldn't have guessed would come into existence 10 years ago so this gentleman makes sure that the emojis that you send on your android phone appears the same way on an on an ios phone so he is essentially translating all of these images into meaningful pictures and um, and and messages so that's the world we live in highly unpredictable highly complex and highly ambiguous and if you think about why this is all important so pierre nantom's work says that if skill building doesn't catch up with the rate of technological progress the g20 economies would lose up to 11.5 trillion dollars in cumulative gdp growth in the next 10 years that's a massive amount of money so in the digital age where it's all volatile you know ambiguous complex uncertain the only way to keep up is to become a continuous learner because prediction is so hard we need to start focusing on the now become a novice and start learning and this is also important from a mindset perspective because somehow when we talk about the future we think of it as though it is uh, it is fixed in stone but in reality we are all creating that future as we speak so if we have that growth mindset and we become continuous learners we'll be able to participate in the story that unfolds from here on so that's essentially the why we all need to learn continuously and stay on top of the game now let's focus on the what one of the realities today is that a lot of lines that we are used to from the industrial era have started blurring away so this is at the core of the book that i am uh, publishing it's uh, going to come out by end of the month it's called clearing the digital blur and because of this phenomenon we need to start looking at competencies from a very different lens gone are the days when we could use industrial competencies uh, the command and control type of competencies that needs to give way to newer competencies so the what of learning also has to undergo a massive change So when I talk about lines blurring away, what sort of lines am I talking about? Blur here is an acronym that stands for boundaryless organizations, limitless digitization, unbounded innovation, and relentless iteration. So that's a mouthful. Let me break that down for you. Boundaryless organizations. Think about Uber, Airbnb. Uh, think about ITC, uh, Ichopal, uh, a, a local example here in India. all of these organizations operate in a boundaryless fashion where they leverage third party resources be it people or capital or infrastructure to uh, turbocharge their growth it's not important for you to produce everything that you're selling as long as you have access that's good enough right so that's the platform mindset that's the ecosystem mindset so that's a new reality for organizations and organizations are becoming boundaryless both externally as well as internally the second element is limitless digitization so today anything that you look at around you be it your your chair your table your computer your mobile phone your fitbit all of these are getting limitlessly digitized and they start producing data which obviously sits on the cloud the third element is unbounded innovation which is all about how industry lines are blurring away right with the connected car the bitcoin the blockchain it's not just one industry that's going to be disrupted it is many industries getting disrupted all at once so that's unbounded innovation and relentless iteration is a story of the now new and the next how all these lines are blurring away as well so while you're working on your current business model the new and the next are playing out already for example uber at this point in time is busy recruiting drivers and enlisting more cars to be on their network that's the now for them but already they are talking about driverless cars and before that can happen the flying taxi is about to uh, become mainstream wherein they will compete with boeing and intel as competition 
So that's essentially the concept of digital blur, and it offers a lens for organization through which you can look at the world around you. So if this is the new reality, so we need different competencies for leaders. In the boundaryless world, leaders need to operate in a networked fashion. You are orchestrators of things, not really producer of things. In the limitlessly digitized world, you need to operate like a sense-making leader, where there's a lot of data. We need to make sense of it and then convert that into a simple story that everybody can understand. Unbounded innovation, as I mentioned earlier, is a story of design and innovation. How do you put the human in the center? How do you put the customer? in the center of your innovation process and track their experience journey instead of looking at the world through the lens of your product or your process. Finally, relentless iteration is essentially an agile story. How do we as leaders become agile both at the strategy level as well as at a project level? So that's how things will change for leaders. Now let's look at mindsets because in in many uh, definitions for digital, you will see that um, you know they say digital is not so much about technology, it is about mindsets, and it is about business models. Boundaryless organizations require a fluid mindset where you have the ability to think about everything that exists out there in the universe, tap into the abundance, and make use of that to drive your business model. Limitless digitization calls for insight-driven mindset, not just information-driven mindset. Unbounded innovation looks for an exponential mindset, not a linear mindset. And relentless iteration really calls for a continuous learning mindset as opposed to a fixed mindset. So that's how mindsets have to change. Now, when you think about what this means from a culture standpoint, there are huge implications as well. Boundaryless organizations have to become open, peering, and sharing. This is not just lip service. They need to essentially live these values. Limitless digitization is all about data-driven culture, unbounded innovation, wherein diversity and inclusion become the, the core pillar of the organization. And ultimately, relentless iteration wouldn't happen without a fail-fast, learn-fast culture. All of these are core pillars for an organization to support the new uh, kind of growth that we need. And obviously, there are a lot of um, competencies and behaviors one could think about for each of these four dimensions. Now let me um, quickly move on to the how, because ultimately this is where the rubber meets the road. We spoke about the why. Why is learning so important in today's context? Um, what is changing in terms of what should we be learning? right? And we should focus also on how do we learn these new concepts in an accelerated fashion. So now let's focus on the how. One thing that has changed, uh, obviously, is the profile of our learner. So today's learner is um, incredibly digital savvy. They've, they are used to a lot of things digital in the consumer world, from a WhatsApp to a Tinder to, a, to an Uber. And this is the profile of the new learner that we will visit, somebody who is asking Santa for, uh, for a gift and also provides the Amazon link for the same. Right? That's a profile of the new age learner. And at the same time, the new age learner is distracted, overwhelmed, impatient, untethered, and social. This is what Josh Burson talks about. So to me, um, a, a worthy pursuit would be to focus on the learner. Can we produce better learners than better learning systems or better learning platforms? I think there lies the key. So at Nonscape, we focus quite a lot on what we call as a 6C approach to uh, learning. Content is obviously just one part of uh, the learning process. Uh, we often give it a lot of weight, uh, but it's just one of the six C's. And even within content, PPT is obviously the one that I'm using currently is woefully outdated. Uh, today, we can talk about virtual reality, augmented reality, gaming. A lot of new age content elements have started coming in. Second is the channel. Not all topics are um, suitable for all kinds of channels. So here channels, I mean the classroom, mobile, online. So we need to pick the right kind of channels for the right kind of content. Context is very important as well. How does a particular topic connect with the organizational context and the learner context? Curriculum. Today, um, we hear a lot about this. There's a lot of video content that's available out there uh, that's ready for consumption. People call this the Netflix model of learning. 
uh, but ultimately without a curriculum behavior change doesn't happen right so superficial learning informal learning can happen but deeper learning really requires a curriculum behind it communities is a social aspect of learning and finally consumption more and more as companies become digitally enabled uh, the one of the challenges that they face is on adoption so unless we think clearly about how to drive consumption how to drive adoption most of these uh, approaches would actually fail so that's essentially the 6c approach of learning and at nolscape we have this point of view that to experience is to learn everything else is just information um, in today's context there's no dearth of information out there video courses moocs online e learning programs but ultimately we do believe that deep mindset and behavioral changes happen when experiential learning is unlocked and uh, at the core of it i do believe that the four h of learning is very important the four h's are head heart hand and habit right so while we understand the head heart and the hand we don't understand the habit loop quite well and to me this is right at the crux of continuous learning to enable continuous learning as part of our culture we need to establish a queue which will draw in learners into the system it puts them through the routine of learning makes it a habit for them and also rewards them at the end of it so that the next time around they are able to look for the same cues again and when this wheel spins you get a learning culture at scale right which is sustainable over a period of time so at nolscape we are big uh, believers in creating habit loops through three different approaches one we use gamification which is very learner centric and very learner friendly analytics which drives behaviors and ai which is um, essentially uh, used for um, uh, for a lot of uh, machine learning and enabling people to learn the right things at the right time so a quick glimpse of this gamifying learning from project management to leadership to management uh, you name it many of these concepts can be gamified to create an outstanding learning experience something that makes them want to come back and learn more and more second analytics uh, something that gives you the sense of progress uh, while you are learning and also for the organization it gives you talent analytics to make the right bet on build versus buy and also uh, ai based um, you know learning systems which are actually on the job where you can help um, you know people learn better at their own time and space so as i mentioned earlier uh, this is the book that's coming out uh, you know check it out it's coming out end of the month published by wiley clearing the digital blur and uh, to experiences to learn everything else is just information as i mentioned earlier uh, on that note i'd like to pass this over to manish hey hi rajiv rajiv can you hear me yes manish i am stopping the share here we can see your video by the way okay not your face Yes, Manish. Uh, you can go ahead and share the screen. Yeah, I'm actually dialing from a mobile, so I don't know okay. how you know I'll be able to share the screen. Okay, so I'll I'll do that for you. Maybe yeah, if if you can uh, you know switch between the slides for me, that would be wonderful. Perfect. Happy to do that. All okay. right. So, Manish, would you like to get started with uh, with a quick introduction? Then we can uh, move forward to your uh, presentation. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Rajiv. Uh, uh, so, hello, everyone. My name is Panish Pehel, and I head the Center for the Future of Work with uh, Cognizant. We are a think tank for the organization, and our charter is to figure out how the future of work works. And for that, uh, you know, we published our thought leadership papers, and one of the recent papers that we published is around the future of learning. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Rajiv and his team uh, for inviting me. You know, as part of this uh, session, really appreciate it. So it's my pleasure to walk you all through some of the interesting insights from our latest white paper, "Relearning How We Learn." So let's get started. The next slide. So first thing, uh, you know, first uh, a quick background uh, on this research. So we surveyed uh, 601 top business executives at leading companies and 262 higher education institutions globally. So for businesses, survey respondents were distributed across the key industries. Uh, as you can see on the screen, and also we covered a good regional mix. But why we did this report? What was the objective of doing this report? As you all know, reskilling is such a hot topic today.
Rajiv, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Manish. Okay. Seems like there is there an echo in my voice. I don't know. This what no, you're coming through fine. Okay, fine. So, so, so basically, you know, artificial intelligence, as we all know, is the great story of our time. Decades in the making, the smart machine is living the laboratory and uh, with increasing speed is infusing itself into each and every aspect of our lives. Within the next few years, AI will be all around us and help us educate our children, heal our sick, and lower our energy bills and uncover many new aspects of our society. That's why 80% of organizations we spoke to, they mentioned that AI will have a significant impact on work in the next five years. But at the same time, next, uh, the age of AI is generating mixed, uh, mixed uh, you know, emotions. On one hand, you have a capitalist dream, you know, the art of the possible, uh, the sense of excitement. There is tremendous pressure on leaders to reduce costs, to stay competitive, and there is no way they can ignore the enormous benefits of AI and automation. But on the other hand, AI means layoffs, especially when you have renowned institutions like Oxford saying that 47% of jobs will disappear over the next uh, 20, 25 years. So this is scary. All this making us rethink the fundamentals of our institutions and the very nature of work itself. But there's a reason to be optimistic. As you see on the next slide, uh, while automation and uh, you know AI will eliminate some jobs, there is no doubt about it. Many more jobs will be created or get changed. As per our estimates, only 12% of jobs are at the risk of being taken over by bots. Only 12%. But still, we are talking about millions of jobs globally. But the point is, 75% of existing jobs will be altered or enhanced by the new machine, which means your employment will remain, but these jobs will be delivered with greater output and with greater quality. And 13% of net new jobs will be created as the new machine creates new revenue opportunities and new job categories that no one usually talks about. That's why we created, uh, we published our two reports, 21 jobs of the future and 21 more jobs of the future. So this is a guide to getting and staying employed uh, in the next uh, you know, 10 years or so. So in total, we have 42 jobs that will become the cornerstone of the future of work and will provide mass employment to many. So the jobs range from low tech and semi obvious, a walker talker to the very high tech and hard to you know, fathom, a genetic you know, diversity officer. So these are the jobs uh, you know, that are going to become cornerstone of the future of work. They're not science fiction. These are the jobs that your HR department will have to fill before very long. Some are highly technical while others won't require much technology at all. So these two reports are a must read to generate new ideas, new thinking, and new ways of working in organizations. And that's where, you know, so the bottom line is, in the future, work will change but won't go away. Many types of jobs will disappear, and many workers will struggle to adjust to the disappearance of the work they understand and find it hard to thrive with the work they don't understand. And that's why preparing the workforce for our future is everyone's job. Not only do companies and higher education institutions need to train people for jobs that currently exist, they also need to prepare them for jobs that don't exist yet. So today, as you can see, only about a quarter of employees and students have the skill base to work and interact with emerging digital technologies. But fast forward 2023, this figure is expected to more than double in the next five years. It's a huge task and will require time, practice, effort, and a lot of resources. And that's where businesses, next slide, have started increasing you know, investment in reskilling their workforce. We found that businesses currently invest around 2% of their total annual revenue on workforce training and learning on average. But that will nearly double to 4% in five years. So you can very well imagine how aggressively companies plan to reskill their workforce. But we have a problem. The next one. It is certain that the transition to the new machine age is not going to be easy. In fact, it's going to be quite an overwhelming experience for many business leaders because there are numerous challenges, as you will see on the next slide, uh, businesses you know, face today. So we found that businesses you know, cited lack of clarity about which skills to prioritize as a top challenge that could impact their reskilling initiatives. Today, if you look at skills have become like mobile apps you know, that need frequent upgrades. And also lack of talent to provide training, training the trainers, poor technology integration of new solutions with existing systems, and misalignment of workforce strategy with the business goals. So we have to radically rethink 
our talent, learning, and workforce management approaches for the new machine age. And that's where we need to break down our old rules, our old rules of learning. So the signs are very clear that the change is upon us. 64% of businesses believe that work will be intertwined with learning in the future as people adapt new skills to align with employment opportunities. So learning while working and working while learning. That's going to become the new normal. And in order to meet the demands of the digital economy, we need to change the way we prepare current and future workforce and ultimately what we think about uh, you know, learning. So what to do about it? That's why we developed the future of learning equation to help entities fundamentally redesign their learning processes and structures by responding to the changes needed to equip people for the work ahead. So bringing these uh, you know, practices to scale will require businesses and higher education institutions to perform the following steps. One, identify skills required for future jobs. And second, curate flexible and adaptive learning content that is updated continuously. And third, embrace new forms of teaching and training. And at the heart of the future of learning is speed for the three elements that will set the pace of learning, which means how quickly we skill and reskill our people, how fast we create content, and the pace at which we provide training. And in order for the future of learning to function effectively, it must be supported with self-learning. So let's look at each of these elements very, very quickly. It's talking about skills. So which skills will be important in the future? So it's not a surprise that AI, robotics, and technical skills you know, will be important. But what's more important, what's very interesting here on this slide is the importance of soft skills. 80% of businesses are saying soft skills will be critical in the future. So future jobs will require a combination of human and technological capabilities. For instance, even big data and data science jobs are more likely to demand creativity, research, and writing skills than other jobs. But seems like higher education institutions, you know, they are missing on this particular respect because they continue to view their role as a knowledge provider and not as a skill provider. And then talking about the content, the second element of the learning equation is content. You know, if you, if you look at it, but before we, we get into it, you know, just, just think about it. When we talk about human skills, you know, it's a very simple math, whether you are in a B2B job or in a B2C job, it's all about uh, becoming a better human at the end of the day. That's a very simple math we are talking about because no matter how technological our age becomes, ultimately we as humans want the human touch. We want technology to help us as a tool, but we don't want technology just for the sake of it. So the next slide is, if you, if you look at it, you know, in the future, the balance between humans and machine is going to be very, very clear. Whereas humans are good at the art of the job, what we call it, which means visual cues, emotion, empathy, judgment, ethics. What's the right thing to do based on the context of the situation? We are quite good at it. And machines are good at the size of the job, which means computational capabilities, number crunching. You can't beat a computer when it comes to number crunching. So based on all statistical evidence, what's the most appropriate next action? And when you blend the two, the art of the job with the size of the job, the magic happens. And that's where each and every employee needs to learn how to collaborate with AI systems. Next. So the, next, uh, the second element uh, you know, of learning equation is content, as I said earlier. So one of our most prominent findings from our research is that businesses are beginning to bear the burden of learning. They intend on uh, you know, speeding the pace of content updates from annual or biennial basis to move to a one to five month or even continuous refresh schedule in the next five years. But higher education institutions are falling uh, you know, behind. So to enable more continuous uh, you know, content updates, businesses and higher education institutions will need to see themselves as curators rather than creators of content. So there is plethora, as Rajiv also pointed out, there's plethora of content already available in the market today, you know, either free or paid. And businesses and educators must adopt Netflix-style learning, which means pay a particular fee and get an unlimited access to content. And the third element of uh, you know, learning equation is training. So the future of learning will be not only about content, but also how it is delivered. So tomorrow's learning experience will be more interactive and frictionless and take place in an environment that blurs the boundaries between the traditional you know, classroom and uh, the world outside of it. 
So AI driven uh, learning platforms will personalize uh, in learning. There's no doubt about it. And also AR, VR, augmented reality, virtual reality systems will become mainstream. So our data reveals that there will be more than 200% increase in the take up of AI and AR VR technologies, both by businesses as well as higher education institutions and within the next uh, you know, five years. So that's going to be pretty significant how AI and AR VR will change the way we learn. So no matter how great uh, you know, our technological age uh, you know, becomes, at the end of the day, you know, we have to ensure that we are enhancing the role of each and every employee in the organization. So this is a wonderful example from uh, you know, Unilever, how the role of a recruiter is getting enhanced. So rather than sending recruiters to elite universities to collect uh, you know, CVs and filtering out uh, those CVs and shortlisting the smartest uh, you know, candidates, everything is done online with the help of uh, AI. So as a candidate, what you need to do is go online, play neuroscience-based games for 15, 20 minutes, and the system will automatically shortlist candidates. And only the shortlisted ones are moved to the next round of interaction you know, with the recruiter, either face-to-face -face or in person. And look at these enormous benefits that the company has got just by enhancing the role of a recruiter. So the AI in this case hasn't replaced a recruiter, but rather strengthened the role of a recruiter. And that's how we should be leveraging AI across the business uh, you know, functions for each and every employee in the organization. I'm not going to go through each and every business benefits in detail, but yeah, these are the benefits that are going to be you know, uh, important when it comes to leveraging AI from business standpoint. And then the you know, speed element, right, is something which is very important uh, because at the end of the day, how quickly we are going to provide uh, you know, skill and reskill our people, how quickly we are going to curate content, and how fast we can deliver those training and uh, you know, teaching approaches. So speed is going to decide the pace of learning in organizations because employable skills will evolve much more rapidly in the future than they do now. And then the next one is, the self-learning, no matter how great your learning and development systems are, if people are not motivated enough to learn new skills faster, the future of work won't happen. So if you look at with the need for skill development more urgent than ever, businesses and higher education institutions are beginning to realize the importance of holding individuals responsible for staying relevant with changing skill demands. And that's where they plan to prioritize self-learning as a key training or teaching approach in the next uh, you know, five years. So just to summarize the next one, the future of uh, work is the mirror image of the future of learning. Now is the time for educators and business leaders to rethink their workforce learning models and their relationship with the future of work. And that's where our future of learning framework, you know, serves as a starting point for understanding what every individual needs to succeed in the work ahead. And as more companies and, uh, you know, institutions embrace the future of learning, they will need to collaborate, uh, you know, effectively with various stakeholders that are there in the market to manage the transformative and disruptive impact of the new machine age. And at the end, learning needs to become the boardroom priority. When there is so much at stake, there is no way businesses can afford to continue to view learning as a reactive function. Next. Next, please. Yeah, so just to you know, summarize, uh, so our uh, report, Relearning How We Learn, it's available in the public domain. You can visit cognizant.com slash feature of learning. You will get an access uh, you know, to this report. Also, there are other assets that we have developed, like a perspective as well as an infographic. So you can have a look at uh, you know, these assets that are available in the you know, public domain. So lastly, I would say, you know, we need to make learning you know, great uh, again, right? That's the whole premise because uh, there is a tremendous need you know, for, for all of us to prepare the workforce for the future jobs. And if we don't do it, obviously many individuals and many organizations will be left behind. So let's make learning great again. So that's my, uh, that's my story, happy to take questions. Great. Uh, thanks, Manish. That was wonderful. And uh, we've done extremely well on time. Uh, so now we'll open the floor for questions. Feel free to uh, post your questions on the chat window, please.
All right. So um, George uh, says that the future of learning equation seems to imply that self-learning, the denominator, takes away from the efficacy of learning. Uh, that's intriguing. So Manish, any point of view on that, on the impact of self-learning uh, on the efficacy of learning? Yeah, that's interesting because if you look at, you know, at the end of the day, right, the way, the reason we develop this future of learning equation is obviously when it comes to skill identification, when it comes to content curation, and then teaching, all these three elements are going to be important. But we believe future of learning won't happen unless people are motivated enough, unless they're curious enough to acquire new skills, to learn new things. That's why, you know, uh, the future of learning needs to be supported with self-learning. And there is so much of talk in the market today about lifelong learning. And lifelong learning, uh, self-learning, you know, it's going to become the new normal in the future. And it needs to be supported. It's just that, you know, organizations need to provide, uh, you know, all the assets, all the tools, all the capabilities, and create the culture of learning so that people are motivated enough, uh, you know, to, to learn new things. So definitely, I think, uh, you know, even the self-learning piece need to be looked, uh, you know, in, uh, uh, you know, in an... Um, uh, in, in collaboration, you know, with uh, all of the three elements that we have described as part of the future of learning equation. Awesome. Sounds good. And Harish has a question. Um, he uh, is wondering about the scalability aspect of mobile learning. Uh, what should be the ideal ratio of ILT and mobile learning? What's the best case scenario? Manish, you want to take that? Uh, I am not sure. I think uh, you could be the best judge, Rajiv. Why don't you? <laughs> okay. So so um, as I mentioned earlier in uh, the six C's uh, that we spoke about, you'd recall that uh, one of the C's is content, the other one is channels, right? So ILT and uh, mobile are two different channels and really what to use um, is a function of who the learner is, what is their, um, what is their function. For example, if it's a, a sales uh, team that you're trying to train, uh, maybe they uh, don't have a desk job and they're constantly on the ground, um, right? And so mobile learning may make sense for that. So it's a function of the learner, their profile, and also the content that's uh, being served, right? So ILT typically has worked really well whenever you want to um, focus on behavioral change, when you want to focus on mindset shifts. ILT is great because you're able to bring a community together um, and you're able to do a lot of role modeling inside the classroom. Whereas mobile, uh, in my experience, has worked really well, one for awareness generation, second for reinforcement of learning. So it really depends on what is the purpose of uh, the learning, what are we trying to achieve. Uh, if it's deep skill building, there is an element of ILT. Um, if it is knowledge and recall, then uh, mobile could be um, uh, the best um, channel out there. And also it depends on what is most suitable for the learner. In all of this, what I would encourage is, let's start from the learner, uh, applying design thinking principles, what works well for them, and let's do what's best for them. So that's uh, how I would approach it, uh, Harish. I hope uh, that answers your question. And Uday has a question on uh, doing uh, training needs analysis, TNA as we call it. Is the traditional method of doing TNA also changing? Uh, I believe so, Uday. So um, from my experience, what companies are doing um, is that for, for transition programs, like for example, individual contributor to first time manager, first time manager to first time leader, all those um, programs that are aligned to organizational development, uh, building you know, succession planning, those programs um, are more or less static at this point in time because that's what the organization wants uh, employees to do. Whereas the informal learning part where, um, you know, one might today learn about data analytics, tomorrow I might learn about VR, it's very difficult to curate uh, or, or um, create a structured curriculum around that because things are changing so fast. So uh, what I see companies do is create uh, micro learning for, um, for any kind of informal learning and macro learning for more structured interventions. Uh, to that extent, I think the TNA is also um, getting changed uh, quite a lot uh, and is becoming a lot more agile. Um, Hari Kumar has, a, has an interesting question. We spoke about curation. On what basis should we curate the content? Manish, do you have a point of view on this? Yeah, so that's an interesting one. Uh, you know, on what basis, right? It all depends on uh, you know the skills that you have identified, uh, you know, for your organization. Skills that are going to be important. Skills that will play an important role over the next, uh, you know, 
uh, 12 to 24 months or so. So based on those skills that you have identified, I think the content curation needs to be you know, done. Uh, because at the end of the day, right, the content that you're going to curate will be, uh, you know, will be based on the skills that you have identified. So those, uh, you know, the content curation should support the skill identification, what you have done for your organization. So I think it's very much uh, linked uh, with, uh, you know, the, the skills that you have identified, that's going to be AI, robotics, or technicals, or soft central skills. One area where the content curation seems uh, like, you know, it's going to be a bit challenging as well, that is going to be on the soft skill part. You know, how are you going to make someone be more empathetic, uh, to be more creative, you know, to be an effective, uh, you know, leader? So these are the skills which are, uh, you know, difficult to address. And that's where the content curation is going to be a little more challenging compared to the traditional skills like, you know, AI, robotics and, uh, uh, you know, technical skills. Uh, so that's where I think the content curation is going to be blend of both, uh, you know, the, the uh, in-person, uh, you know, training, in-person learning, and also the content that is already available in the market. Uh, but to answer your question, it directly, you know, links with the, the skills that you have identified for your organization. Yeah, so if I may add to what uh, Manish uh, just mentioned, uh, curation can happen uh, through AI. Obviously, by looking at your learning patterns, uh, you know, what your KPIs, your performance metrics, uh, AI can start recommending uh, new courses, new videos, new material for you to consume. So that's one way of doing curation. The next one is uh, the human-led curation, which I think uh, we don't talk enough about, but I think there's something to be said about human-led curation. And in my mind, um, L&D teams in the future will play a very important role uh, curating content, right? So there's an extent to which AI can uh, create a, a playlist of courses that you need to do, but ultimately learning like anything else is very context dependent as well. Design thinking in an auto industry is very different from design thinking in banking. So what does that topic mean in our context is something that uh, the LND function can, um, you know, contribute a lot on. So I do see um, human um, you know, curation also playing a role um, along with uh, AI-driven curation. But ultimately, yeah. uh, it's a combination of what the learner wants, what the organization wants, and what is appropriate for uh, people at different levels within the organization, right? So design thinking for a CEO is not the design thinking for a first-time employee, right? So those um, uh, different aspects relating to context, uh, maybe a human being at this point in time can add a lot of value in. Right. And just to add on to, you know, what you were saying, Rajiv, you know, since you talked about L&D, I believe the future of L&D is going to be uh, more of a facilitator and not a controller, you know, of learning. Uh, if you look at the role of a, you know, pilot, right, uh, from airline industry has changed with the autopilots, right? On similar lines, I think uh, the future of L&D is going to be becoming, an, uh, you know, becoming a pilot and the LMS is going to be the autopilots. So they should be doing everything. And rather than, you know, as an LD professional, you should be sitting and guiding, you know, your autopilot, your LMS. Uh, that is going to be based on AI and other technologies. So ultimately, it's, uh, you know, the role of LD is going to be becoming a facilitator and not a controller of learning. And once you do that, it's much easier for you to start curating content that is already available or leveraging, uh, you know, AI to figure out what sort of uh, content that will be effective from your learner needs. Yeah, that's a great point, Manish. So next one um, is on AR and VR. Um, how quickly uh, can we create AR and VR content? And also, are you familiar with some good examples where uh, these technologies have been put to great use? Yeah, so I think that's very good. If you look at, you know, uh, AR, VR, let me give one, one very interesting example. A VR-led training in diversity, inclusion, and empathy lets employee experience the workplace in someone else's shoes. So this could be a great example. I think that there are a couple of organizations that are uh, you know, leveraging AR, VR technologies to uh, train their customer service agents how to empathize better with the you know, customers. Right, a customer, uh, you know, who's uh, going through, uh, you know, a significant pain and needs some, you know, empathy. How to do that? How to really understand, you know, the customer pain? So I think, uh, you know, from soft skill perspective, you know, AR, VR technologies are going to be very, very, you know, handy. How quickly you can build it, right? Again, there are, uh, you know, there are some off-the-shelf uh, 
uh, solutions available in the market today. There are so many startups working on. Uh, I believe it all depends on the intensity of the uh, course that you really plan to develop, intensity of the training that you really uh, you know plan to develop. I think it's going to vary, but yeah, this is something that can be you know done very very you know quickly. And we need to look at the you know some of the soft uh, you know some of the low hanging fruits around the AR VR. Uh, you know, AR, VR, that is going to have a much greater impact on, uh, you know, employee understanding of how to view the world in someone else's shoes. So that's where I think soft skill, you know, leveraging AR, VR for soft skill is going to be a great, uh, you know, thing for organizations uh, to help, uh, you know, employees uh, learn, you know, from, from uh, different uh, uh, perspectives. Yeah, so the other area where AR and VR can be quite handy is in technical learning. Um, I'm sure you've seen the video of a BMW uh, mechanic who actually doesn't know how to repair uh, the car. And ultimately, a car today is um, a chip on wheels, right? So the person opens the hood and um, looks at the engine with uh, an augmented reality uh, device on his head, right? And this device uh, breaks it down to him in terms of step-by-step uh, -step instruction what needs to be done. So the four years of technical training uh, that a person would otherwise, or two years of technical training uh, that a person would otherwise go through to reach this level of mastery is being delivered just in time. Uh, to me, that's revolutionary, right? So you can crunch uh, learning and make it available just in time, accelerate uh, development of people. And so a lot of other areas, medical um, learning, I can see huge potential for AR and VR. And in our own context um, at Nolscape, we have developed uh, onboarding solutions around uh, VR. Imagine you are the, uh, you're joining an organization, this is your day one, and uh, you, you obviously have a lot of anxiety around um, what's in store for you. But uh, imagine if there is an AR or a VR uh, solution which allows you to wander around uh, the organization, uh, see the different um, you know, uh, attractions on, on campus and each of these attractions speak to you. Uh, maybe an ATM speaks to you, uh, maybe um, uh, a counter at the reception speaks to you, uh, right? And, and, and so uh, even the CEO of the organization can uh, come and talk to you on day one through an AR or a VR device. So we've seen um, a lot of success on, in onboarding, in procedural training, uh, maybe in factory, um, you know, uh, blue collar learning as well. I think uh, AR and VR can uh, play a big role in addition to the uh, the, the soft skills training that uh, Manish uh, spoke about. So the next one uh, is from Shashi Gupta uh, who has this question. What do you think the top areas of future skills would be for business and higher education? Manish, do you want to take that? What are the top skills that businesses and higher education uh, institutions are uh, talking about? Yeah, something that I, you know, highlighted as part of the session as well, right? We believe the future of skills is going to be turning humans and machines into collaborative colleagues. Uh, so that's where, you know, some of the technical skills, uh, robotic skills are going to be important. There is no doubt about it. But uh, also the importance of soft skills is going to be there. Uh, we believe two types of AI skills will emerge in the future. Skills to build machines and skills to collaborate with them. Right. So obviously people who want to build the career in robotics or AI, right, will understand all the nuances, you know, the technological, uh, you know, requirements that are there to build an AI system. But the latter, you know, how to collaborate with them. This is something that each and every worker needs to learn, uh, you know, how to getting, uh, how, you know, how to get familiarized uh, with AI systems by learning basic technical constructions and tweaking, you know, machine capabilities to exploit the full value of the system. One very good example here is, you know, at the Singapore Changi Airport Terminal 4, uh, if you have visited, sorry, if you have visited, you know, their, their Terminal 4. So what is happening there is, you know, jobs did not disappear when the airport implemented facial recognition capabilities in its automated check-in and uh, boarding, you know, systems and high resolution X-ray into its baggage checks. So instead, the nature of jobs has changed. So now airport staff, you know, spend more time guiding and assisting travelers as well as attending and overseeing the automated machines. So that's going to be the you know, future of uh, you know, skill, right? How to collaborate with the uh, uh, AI systems and how to you know, monitor them, how to oversee them 
because at the end of the day, you will still need humans to oversee, you know, machines. So definitely, I believe robotics, AI skills, human centric skills, technical skills, all these skills need to be blended uh, to create the future of, uh, you know, work. And uh, that is going to be important from a you know, skills perspective. Uh, Rajiv, I don't know if you want to add on Yeah, yeah. So um, in terms of future skills, um, in the Blur framework that I spoke about earlier, um, there are a few things that we need to be mindful of. Uh, from mindset's perspective, um, to begin with, uh, in the boundaryless world where the boundaries are just disappearing, organizational boundaries, team boundaries, um, the inside versus outside sort of boundaries, um, it's useful to always start with the outside in. Right? What is what is someone else doing? If they, this must be a problem that others are solving. What's the best solution out there that's available currently? And how do I, using APIs or whatever, uh, make use of those innovations and build on top of it instead of, uh, you know, reinventing the wheel? Right. So that's um, that's one mindset. Second is embracing data insights, storytelling. All these are very important skills uh, going forward. That's aligned with L from Blur, limitless digitization. Unbounded innovation is thinking boundaryless um, from an innovation standpoint, and there it's about uh, thinking exponential, right? Instead of being linear, so design thinking is an important one. Uh, innovation is an important uh, area of focus, and finally, relentless iteration, if you'd recall, is all about agility, right? How do you uh, do anything uh, that you're doing in an agile fashion, in a highly responsive manner? Uh, so that again is a mindset change. So these are uh, the big changes that we are tracking at Nallscape and, um, and, and going forward you'll see most of these will become the norm. We won't even be talking about it as a special case. This will be um, just routine business as usual. All right, so uh, Hani Arora has a good question. Uh, with the speed of change that we are anticipating, uh, would that mean the content that would be available to consumer would be prediction based instead of user requirement or data based? So I, I'm guessing the question is about predictive analytics. Can we start predicting what people might want to learn? Almost like Amazon, right? Uh, if you've bought this uh, particular product, you might also um, like these two other products. So it, it's getting into the prediction realm. Uh, Manish, any thoughts on this one? Yeah, that's very important, I believe, you know, because if you look at data will serve as a foundation to accelerate the speed of learning in organizations, how quickly you collect skill identification data, you know, whether it is coming from labor market data or employees data, students data, and then analyze and apply it for content, uh, you know, curation, right? That is going to be based on data intelligence and not gut feeling and then feed it into the AI driven training and teaching systems to deliver personalized, uh, you know, learning. So I believe definitely yes, uh, you know, the, the prediction, the predictive analytics is going to play a very, very important role in uh, identification of skills and then also uh, from a, you know, content curation perspective. Yes, I agree with that, uh, Manish. Uh, so the next question is uh, interesting from um, uh, Jeffrey Rakesh. Leadership coaching also would be the need of the hour going forward. I think this is more personal one-to-one -one coaching could be virtual as well your views on this. So I'll take that one. I do believe that end of the day, it's an and strategy for learning, right? Um, while technology and digital is allowing you to explore a lot more than ever before. So you're able to um, limitlessly learn whatever it is that you're interested in, you get access to content free of cost uh, from the best of uh, sources. But ultimately, for deeper change to happen, we do need a mirror. Um, and in today's context, we, we use uh, leadership coaches as uh, people that we like to bounce off our, our uh, issues with and, and, um, and get some guidance or direction, uh, at least some deep questions that make us think, right? Um, although the, the, whether this should be human or not is a question I'm starting to see a lot of uh, AI-driven coaches uh, coming into play. But I have a sense that ultimately we will need a human connect. We will feel comfortable with a human connection. Ultimately, we are social animals. Um, you know, we've grown up this way over many, many centuries, right? It's very hard to give that up um, overnight. So I do think that uh, even next few years down the road, we will value that human connect, a person who is able to construct meaning along with us um, because, um, yeah, end of the day, we are social. Manish, any thoughts on this? 
Yeah, that's very interesting because obviously, you know, uh, the, the whole premise of doing this report, the future of learning is if you look at the, we need humans at the end of the day. By leveraging AI, AR, VR, and other technologies, it doesn't mean you know the human uh, you know connect is going to be out of the picture. Rather, uh, you know AI is going to help leaders. Uh, you know, it's going to free up their time so that they can be made very much focused on what really matters to employees, what really matters you know to the business. And the same thing is uh, with L and D professionals by freeing up their time from day to day, from repetitive, from monotonous tasks, L&D can focus on what really matters to their employees as well as uh, you know, to the business. So definitely I believe uh, AI, uh, AR, VR and other technologies will help us strengthen the human connect you know, that we have. And that's where leadership is going to play a very, very important role in creating that culture of learning across the organization. Great. Um, we have a few more questions. I, I um, am mindful of uh, the time as well. We just have one more minute for uh, the webinar, but I'd like to uh, do some justice to these two questions with your permission. Um, one is on uh, the adoption challenge, right? So with all of these new things coming in, uh, Shivani uh, is asking us a question. How do you think we can remove this uh, gap between the old school and the new school? How do you increase uh, adoption and adaptability of people? Uh, Manish, any thoughts on that? Uh, the uh, what is the question? I'm sorry. How do you think we can remove the gap between old school learning models to new advances in learning? How do you think we can remove this gap and how to how to increase uh, adoption and adaptability of people? Okay, okay, that's a very good point because if you look at you know learning definitely needs a reboot in organizations in higher education institutions, right? Because if you look at uh, the traditional you know learning strategies, training uh, you know strategies, they have roots. Uh, in the industrial economy. So those uh, training approaches were fine for the industrial economy, but not for the new machine age. So definitely, yes, we need to overhaul, uh, you know, our entire tra training and learning approaches. And that's why we developed the future of learning equation. So what are the three elements you really need to consider and how speed is going to play an important role and then how to promote the culture of, uh, you know, self learning. So these elements are going to be, you know, important because uh, Without overhauling, you know, the existing, uh, you know, the, the content, uh, you know, creation, the content curation aspects, without overhauling the existing training and, uh, you know, teaching approaches, it will be very difficult for organizations to prepare workforce that is fit for the future. So, so, so definitely, I believe uh, it's not going to be an easy thing. Rather, it's going to be a very challenging task. And that's where leaders need to stand up, you know. They have to uh, you know, lead with example. They have to set the example for the entire organization to follow because learning needs to become a boardroom priority. And that's one of the key messages you know, from our report. With so much at stake, it is essential for learning to move from a water cooler topic you know, to a key agenda point for boardroom discussion so that concrete decisions can be made. So definitely, we believe moving forward, you know, as more and more leaders are going to embrace the future of uh, skills, future of, uh, you know, their own organization, future of their own job. It's going to, you know, we would witness a lot of changes that are taking place in organizations from learning and from training standpoint. Yeah, that's a great uh, answer, Manish. So uh, from the adoption perspective, I just had one more thing to add. Um, so at Nolscape, we have a three-pronged approach for adoption um, and for uh, helping people adapt to this. One is gamification. Uh, when you make learning fun, uh, irrespective of the level of uh, employee you're dealing with, be it a CXO, board member, to first-time employee, we've seen that draws people in, right? Um, so the design, uh, great design produces great desire, as somebody said, right? So great design in learning is a must for creating the pull factor. Oftentimes, we, we approach it from an industrial perspective, pushing out learning, push is the word. Um, that doesn't help us, right? So we need to create um, a learning model that creates a pull. The second element is uh, to use uh, analytics. So like you know, many B2C companies are using, analytics is a great way to create stickiness. Uh, like the way LinkedIn does it. You know, while you were away, Ramesh and Suresh got a new job, and uh, 23 people viewed your profile. And it produces a behavioral change in you. It makes you want to go back into LinkedIn and do something. So how can we use analytics to drive uh, behaviors? And finally, I think AI is the other thing. As long as things are personal, in the industrial world, things were one size fits all. Uh, but today, one size fits all doesn't work. And, and AI is a, is a great um, way of personalizing things. So if we approach things with a one size fits none approach, then it might create 
again, extraordinary pull for learning. So these are three things that we've tried and tested over a period of time uh, to considerable uh, success. And there's one final question on ILT. What will happen to ILT? Any new innovation over there? There's a question from uh, Shrishti. Uh, definitely, I see the, uh, the instructor-led component, be it virtual or in classroom, um, is undergoing a change. Uh, we need to view the classroom very differently. Classroom is not for um, one directional information push. Um, you know, internet is great for that. What we need to do in the classroom is experiential learning, right? How can we put that learning into practice gain some confidence like uh, Malcolm Gladwell says that uh, 10,000 hours of facilitated practice is what gives you mastery, right? So the role of the classroom needs to change and hence the role of um, facilitators and the ILT approach also has to change. So we are um, over time. Unfortunately, we need to wrap it up here. I'd like to thank Manish um, for his contribution and for his presence in this uh, webinar. Absolutely delightful insights. Thank you so much, Manish, for uh, being here and sharing your insights with us. Thanks, Rajiv. Thanks for the invite. Really appreciate it. Yeah, and, and thank you all uh, for participating. I hope this was useful. Uh, please do reach out to us. Our, our coordinates are right there on the screen. Feel free to reach out to us. I'll just um, uh, you know end this with one inspirational um, TED talk that I watched from uh, Gary Kasparov. I always end my uh, talks with this these days. Uh, if you've not watched this talk, please do watch it. Uh, he is obviously um, a chess grand champion who lost to a computer in the year 1997-98. Uh, he didn't take to that result too well. He said, connect me to a computer which has massive amounts of data, then let's see what happens. right? And, uh, and we started doing research around it as humans. We wanted to uh, find out if we can match the machines. Guess what? In the year 2014, uh, in the Freestyle Chess Championship, the human-machine combination systematically beat the machine. So to me, that's an empowering story. Uh, while there is a narrative around AI taking human, taking over human jobs, I think there's a different narrative that we can all embrace, which is if we don't fear the intelligent machine, if we start embracing them, perhaps the future uh, will be bright for all of us. And it is indeed uh, an ampersand or an and that is at play. It is not just the machine or the human. It's a combination of the two that's going to create the magic. Uh, with those uh, final thoughts, I'd like to sign off. Thank you so much for participating in this uh, webinar. I really hope uh, this was useful for all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Anish.